Welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and today is Halloween. Now, Fresh Waves usually brings you an upbeat, interesting show with tons of education. And today we're bringing you a show with tons of education, but it's got a little bit of a spooky edge to it because today is Halloween. Our guests are Lori Benson and her friend, Allison, and we're going to talk about the origins of Halloween, the history of Halloween, what Halloween really is. It's a fascinating show of spooky things that go eek in the night. (laughs) Let's take a listen while Lori tells us the true meaning of Halloween. It is a very sacred day. It is the New Year for the Celtic New Year. Year. And and the years were always, the festivals were all celebrated on the eve. So Halloween means All Hallows Eve, which was the the word they gave to it later. But it's Samhain, spelt S-A-M-H-A-I-N. Good old Celtic (laughs) spelling. So Samhain. The internet that said it rhymes with cow in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sowin. Sowin. Cow in. Okay. But uh, that's one of the things they would do is they would bring livestock in for the, um, and they'd also butcher the livestock. So there was a lot of blood involved and, and they'd also, uh, enjoy the celebration of bringing in the, the butchery. Okay. Now, of course. Was this a, in a sacrificial sort of way or? No, it, a- it, more just practical. Getting ready for winter. Getting ready for winter. You can't feed all of that, that livestock over the winter. So they would then bring them in, butcher them, and and salt it, preserve it, dry it, whatever they needed to do, and have a huge feast, of course. Mm-hmm. So there was there was that um, blood and guts involved, but it was also the honoring of the god of the dead. So that's where the name Samhain comes from, and it goes way way back, I think, to Sanskrit even. Um, the this is the time when the dead walk. The veils of the earth, of the of, of reality, are parted, and the dead can walk through, and the living can see them and communicate with them. So this becomes a very sacred time. Now, the whole dressing up stuff comes from you want to fool them. Okay? You don't want them dragging you back. So if you're dressed as one of the dead or one of the other spirits... You're not going to be dragged back into into the world of the dead. You're going to stay on the world of the living, but you've confused them. So, um, yeah, yeah, there you go. Are you fascinated yet? I know I am. I wanted to ask more questions of Laurie and Allison, so I asked, "How old is Halloween?" Well, it's <laughs> it's eons old. It's way before Christ. It's way before um, our normal. Um, what we see them as religions had evolved. So it's very, very pagan. It's very, very earthy. It's very back to the, back to nature, back to, well, when you just look at actually, uh, right now, when, um, we're in the Northern Hemisphere and the days are getting very short. Mm-hmm. And of course, you're going through that whole harvest of, of the animals and you're looking at a long winter coming up. Yeah. There is something that you have to, ward off because that winter can be brutal so you need to protect yourself as much as possible to get through the darkness that's coming Mm -hmm. so that's the darkness that we are celebrating tricking fooling and disguising ourselves against this was getting better all the time and i was still curious to find out more so i asked are the two worlds closer together on All Hallows' Eve? They, there's a rift. They okay. pull apart, and people can get through either side. That's why you will have people um, doing divination and that type of thing. It's because you can com- commune with the dead. So it's not that they're close, because then they would overlap, but they're actually pulled apart. There's a rift. There's a, there's a stretch in the fabric of, of life and death at that point where the spirits can walk through, you can commune back, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting time. Interesting, very interesting indeed. But where did all this trick-or-treating come from? You feed, uh, feed the, the 
the spirits spirits who are coming and um they won't pull you back through or you put something out that scares them like a face with a light inside <laughs> That, that makes sense. There's in, in Scotland, they used to do them with turnips. Well, they didn't have yeah. uh, they didn't have pumpkins no. in, in the Europe old days. They did it too with, yeah, with turnips, white turnips. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the the shining faces through the turnips, and uh, yes, and mumming is an old old tradition, and I think that's where our Halloween comes from, as people going door to door and and asking for treats and and trick or treat. So you play a trick on them if you don't get a treat, but you could also perform for them and get a treat. So, so the mummers would would go around and uh, ask for their treats, but they had to perform. Mummering, what is mummering? The person dressed up, basically. Uh, yes, the 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 men like to dress like women, and the women like to dress like men, and they'd all uh, try to fool the neighbors into not knowing who they were when they came round. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we used to do mummy on uh, uh, Boxing Day in Toronto with the Irish players. Okay. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an ancient, ancient tradition. We you know, burn cork, cork blacken our faces with the burnt end of the cork, which was traditional. And yeah, I, I was a boy, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the men were women, and we go around. But you, you know, you have to perform for your for your for your drink and your treat. And this is on New Year's you did this? This was the Boxing Day. Day. Boxing Day, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, St. Stephen's Day. Uh, had to do with the wren being uh, um, a sacred bird that had flown higher than the eagle because it had ridden on the eagle's shoulders. <laughs> but because it had tricked the eagle, um, the boys would do in ancient Ireland was they'd have an effigy of a wren and put it on a piece of furs, which is bushy kind of stuff and they go around saying they needed to bury the wrens they need money to bury the wren so it's called uh, the wren boys we go around so similar to our trick-or-treating a little bit more macabre uh, but our no maybe less <laughs> maybe less i was gonna say have you been out for halloween lately holy mackerel <laughs> witches come out on halloween one of the chances shell out shell out the witches are out Are there good witches and bad witches? Or are they just all witches? The good witches do more um, in the way of healing than anything else. They're they're the ones that, uh, the herbalists that people used to go to before we had the medical establishment that we have now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the herbalists, the midwives, the... But, yes, um, the good witches can weave spells of protection if somebody needs it. Because you don't have to be a witch to cast evil at somebody. I mean, we've got lots of modern witches. There's tons of uh, different um, traditions of of witch that... uh, Well, the Wiccans are a big society of witches, Mm -hmm. so they say. White magic, so they say. So they say. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean it's white magic all the time. Yes. (laughs) So yeah, there's, so there's the the Wiccan uh, tradition. There's neo pagans. There's uh, Druidic. There's uh, you can go on and on. All kinds of different uh, traditions out there, and, and many will um, identify themselves as witches, men and women. Mm-hmm. But um, and it's becoming more acceptable mm-hmm. for people to see the witches, whereas before they were quite hidden because society. Would burn them. Would burn them. <laughs> burn them at yeah, the stake. Yeah. Try and get rid of them. And and yes, it's much more acceptable too in Canada, where we have freedom of religion. Um, in the states, a lot of people have to keep their uh, their paganism or witchcraft or whatever hidden, especially if they're getting into child custody problems or something like that, because uh, certain states are very very anti uh, anything that's not. What Southern Baptist, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, up here, a lot of people are not afraid to wear their pentacles openly, or, or any type of other type of witchcraft identification. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a friend who, this, and we're talking about thirty years ago, uh, petitioned York University where he was working to get the Wiccan holidays off 
and he would work the Christian holidays. And he actually went to court with this and, and was granted the uh, permission to take Halloween and uh, the, the solstices off and work Christmas and Easter. I mean, I don't know if witches were part of Halloween way, way back in the day. Were they? If we're talking about the, the, the rift widening between living and dead, I mean, it's the witches that, that can walk that path, that can communicate between okay. the two worlds. So um, there would have been sorceresses, there would have been sorcerers, there would have been people who are shamans, you know, people who could bridge that gap and yeah. help people. And the Druids were all about that too, weren't they? I, I, I imagine, yes. Yeah. So, but in the traditional sense of, you know, witches sitting on brooms and cackling away and flying through the sky. Oh, that's fun. Isn't it fun? Yeah. I, I, I like, that's one of my favorite parts of Harry Potter was the, the Quidditch, oh, which yeah. is all the broom flying so fast and yes. crazy yes. around. But that's such a part of Halloween. You see that black silhouette in the sky and the moon shining through it and the witch is going through the moon. And modern day plastic witches stuck up against trees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and kitchen witches. People have kitchen witches to this day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Little symbols yeah. of witches in the kitchen that ward off evil spirits. Witches are fascinating. Ancient, mysterious, spooky. Good, nice, friendly, and fun. Laurie and Allison are two of the friendliest witches you'll ever meet. We're so happy to have them on the show today. We'll be right back. You're listening to Fresh Waves, and this is our Halloween special. Stay tuned. This is the Halloween special on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. This is a great show and we're happy to have you on board this morning. If you've missed a part of the show or you'd like to hear it again, you can always tune in on YouTube and hear us there. We're at Fresh Waves Radio on YouTube. Like us, subscribe to us. Um, What a great way to start your day with some fresh waves. We're going to get back to the show now. Happy Halloween, everyone. We briefly touched on the fact that Halloween, All Hallows Eve, is in fact the Celtic New Year. Would it be the day, it's the eve of the Celtic New Year's? That's right. Um, the the day is always celebrated the night before. Okay. Okay. So that's the eve. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, that that would be the beginning of the new year. Would be the next day. So you want to um, get rid of all your old demons. Demons. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, the night before, and then start the year afresh, and the the new year. Now, New Year is indifferent. Um, cultures, are, it's not always uh, January 1st. No. Um, often it's around the solstice because that's when the days start getting lighter. But um, Jewish New Year's is, of course, in September. Well, it's September, October, depending, because it's a mm-hmm. lunar yeah. calendar, so yeah. it's different lunar every calendar. year. <laughs> but uh, I always feel that um, you know, Samhain is a good time to celebrate, to look back on what your whole past year has been. And then you've got that kind of dark period of meditation, um, of solitude mm-hmm. coming up, and then you can start again through that. So that looks like uh, possibly why that is considered the new year in the Celtic... Uh, in the Celtic calendar. Mm-hmm. So is there... What, what, what are the... Cel- what, what happens then on the eve? Is it what North America has turned into Halloween? We have all the costumes and everything. What do the Celtic people do on this day? Well, if you're following traditional, um, you know, it would be neo-pagan, obviously, because we don't know exactly what people did. Um, you'd probably uh, spend the night uh, communing with your ancestors, perhaps doing some divination. Um, we always leave a meal out for those departed. And um, you get your messages for the next year, basically. So you wouldn't be outside going to neighbors' houses? Nope. You might have a bonfire. Um, 
because that would be traditional. It's a it's a fire celebration. Um, in the old days, the cattle would be driven between two bonfires, and I guess that was to purify them, to um, make sure that they were ready for. Uh, you know, I guess the the smoke would would clear any beasties out of their out of their fur, <laughs> so you could have the hides and and things would be cured. Um, there would be, uh, yeah, there's a certain amount of reveling, too. I mean, if you're going to be staying up all night, you're not just going to be looking into your, into your, uh, crystal ball, yeah, crystal ball, your, your scrying <laughs> bowl or whatever you're, you're doing. So they're, you scrying know, bowl? What's that? A scrying bowl would be a, a bowl of water. Sometimes you put some ink into it to make it dark. So instead of a crystal bowl, ball, you have a bowl that you can still see the images coming through into. So, you know, looking for messages for the, for the coming year. Ah, oh, one of the, um, things that, uh, people still do today is a girl can peel an apple. Mm-hmm. Have you heard this one? No. Okay. You peel an apple, and if you can get your peel all in one piece, throw it over your shoulder, and it will give you the letter of the man you're going to marry. Letter of the first name. How? Uh, by looking at the apple peel. The way it lands the on the ground. The way it lands on the ground. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, yes. It will look like a letter of the alphabet. Yes. <laughs> oh. oh we, do, we used to do that. That's kind of neat. We never did marry any of those guys. <laughs> 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 so that sounds more like an old superstition. Yes. Yeah, but apples and, uh, oh, I was, uh, yes, bobbing for apples. Yes, mm-hmm. that was part of always Halloween parties was okay. bobbing for apples. You know what that really means? <sighs> no. You're retrieving the souls from the cauldron of regeneration. Oh, rebirth. isn't that neat? Yeah. That's why the apples also with the apple peels. So we're retrieving souls. And I guess that goes way back to the apple in um, Greek mythology with uh, Helen and the golden apple and the whole reason for the Tro- Trojan War. Was, Why? Well, because uh, Helen was stolen from Troy and uh, given the golden apple. Um, and the Trojans, of course, wanted her back. She's the princess. The, uh, yeah. So yeah, Apples are very significant this time of year. Mm-hmm. Well, they're a heck of a good sustenance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. At the very least. And they're certainly, you know, ripe and ready to collect. And you've got to get them off the trees before they freeze. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yes, what about the devil? What about the devil? Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about how the devil gets into all of this at Halloween. And um, then we'll read a story. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it, Jay? It sure does. We're talking about Halloween. And Halloween seems to me, from what we've been talking about, to be kind of the start of all of these different holidays that will go from now right through until Christmas or the holiday season. This is kind of the kickoff. I know Americans think that it's American Thanksgiving, but it actually sort of starts here, doesn't it? And then from here we get to the solstice, which is the longest night of the year. And again, that's about fire and light and those kinds of celebrations. And then the days get longer, right? Because right now they're starting to get shorter. Yes, you can feel it. They're really obviously. getting, yes. yeah. <laughs> I know. I hate this time of year, yeah. honestly. <laughs> I know a lot of people yeah. love the fall. I, it's my least favorite time of the year. Well, they call it the wheel of the year. And um, by celebrating the different festivals that go around the year, and some of them are lunar and some of them are solar. So this is a lunar festival, and it probably would have been celebrated on the full moon. Which originally. was, what, yesterday, um, wasn't it? Night? It was yesterday. Last yes. night. So... Then the next one is solar, so that's exactly um, the solstice. The solstice. So the longest night. Then the next one is lunar, and that would be in bulk, which is um, the the quickening of of the spring coming in. So February second, mm-hmm. uh, candle mass is what uh, Christians have have uh, called renamed it, renamed it, renamed it, christened it. <laughs> 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 and then and then you have uh, and again um, it would have been a lunar holiday. And then you have um, the uh, e- equinox, the spring equinox, mm-hmm. which is solar. And then you have another lunar one after that, which is Beltane, or May the 1st kind of celebration. And then, it, so it goes. So there's eight festivals throughout the year that should be observed if you want the year to 
turn properly, the wheel of the year. So people would feel that they had to celebrate this because observances are fine, but what what if you didn't? Mm-hmm. What if you didn't? Mm-hmm. You know, winter might never come or winter might come and stay or whatever, you know. What if you didn't? Mm-hmm. Um, human beings have always given themselves such importance, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, there's a train of thought right now that says everyone talks about how we have to save the planet. And in fact, the planet will survive. Mm-hmm. It is us that won't. So we're actually having to save ourselves. It's all about us. Yeah. We are somehow together going to make the world keep going. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if we didn't do what we do, it wouldn't happen. No, the sun won't come up. No. no. Even though if we actually weren't here, the sun would continue to come up and uh, things would go on quite nicely without us. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I always worry about that uh the greeting in, at, around Christmas time when people say peace on earth, I'm thinking, all right, the way that the earth would be peaceful would be probably without people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scary. It it's is a little scary, scary but yeah. it's probably quite true. Although, you know, there is something to be said for uh, the violence involved in an alligator chomping up a wildebeest, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody yeah, has but he to doesn't eat. do whole villages. <laughs> no, he doesn't. That's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, so we were your story that you're going to be reading to us yes. deals with the devil. Absolutely. This is a story from the Brothers Grimm, who collected stories in the uh, in Europe of the uh, 1800s and uh, wrote them all down. And many of these stories have their roots way, way back before that. This particular one is called The Grave Mound, deals with the devil, deals with uh, threes, the number three, and how important that is. Okay, well, the, the Brothers Grimm, they were not the nicest guys, were they? Or, or they were the nice, they were nice guys, but the, the stories, people always think that fairy tales <laughs> are nice stories, but in fact, fairy tales can be kind of They've been very, nasty. very grim in the... Uh, 1M sense of the word. Um, no, the Grimm brothers were folklorists. Okay. So, so they just gathered the stories gathered that the were stories. already there. Yes. And for some reason over the years, the fairy tales have well, turned into like a lot of Mother Goose things where they've they're been just sweet. Bodlerized. What's Bodler that? Bodler was a, uh, an educator in England who thought that, uh, the uh, original folk tales were way too nasty for the children to hear, so he uh, sweetened them up. So, uh, you know, things like Little Red Riding Hood getting eaten up uh, doesn't happen, or her grandmother getting eaten up doesn't happen, or it gets reversed some way that's magical. But in the original stories, no. So what was with people back in those early days when they would write stories that were so morbid and and well it awful? was it was a it was a world of uh, many dangers and people weren't as civilized as they are now I suppose although it seems to me that dropping bombs on people is not terribly civilized anyway the so grave the, mound the grave mound is the name of this story and you've got this from a book that's what is this book called so we can it's called the complete fairy tales of the brothers grimm and it's an all new translation by jack zipes although all new is not really correct anymore because this was probably 1980 <laughs> okay but that's okay if it's 1980 um it's so these are the stories as as the, Gr- the Brothers Grimm, Grimm collected, collected them. So yes. these have not been niceified. That's exactly right. Okay. Yes. We're going to hear a nice story now. I love being read to. This is going to be fun. Take it away. One day, a rich farmer stood in his yard and looked over his fields and gardens. The corn sprouted vigorously. The fruit dangled abundantly from the fruit trees. The grain of the previous year still lay in such large piles in the loft that the rafters could barely support them. Then he went into the stable to look at the well-fed oxen, the fat cows, and the glistening horses. Finally, he returned to his room and took a look at his iron chests in which he kept his money. As he was standing there surveying his wealth, he suddenly heard a loud knocking. However, it was not a knocking at the door of his room, but at the door of his heart. 
It opened up, and he heard a voice that said to him, Have you done good things with all this for your kindred? Have you been aware of the needs of the poor? Have you shared your food with the hungry? Have you been satisfied with what you have, or have you always demanded even more? His heart did not hesitate with the answer. I've been hard and pitiless, and have never done good things for my kindred. If a poor person came my way, I turned my eyes away from him. I haven't cared about God, but have thought only about increasing my wealth. Even if everything under the sky had become mine, it would still not have been enough for me. Upon hearing this answer, the rich man was greatly horrified. His knees began to tremble, and he had to sit down. Once again he heard a knocking, but this time it was a knocking on the door of his room. It was his neighbor, a poor man, who had numerous children and could no longer feed them. I know, the poor man thought, my neighbor is rich, but he is just as hard as he is rich. I don't believe he'll help me. But my children are screaming for food, so I'll have to take the risk. So he said to the rich man, You don't readily give away things that belong to you, but I stand before you as one who can barely keep his head above water. My children are starving. Lend me four bushels of grain. The rich man looked at him for a long time. Then the first sunbeam of kindness began to melt part of the ice of his greediness. I won't lend you four bushels, he responded. Instead, I'll give you eight as a gift. But there is one condition that you must fulfill. What must I do? asked the poor man. When I'm dead, you're to watch over my grave for three nights. The peasant felt very uneasy when he heard the proposition. However, he would have consented to anything because of his terrible situation. So he agreed to do it, carried the grain home with him. It was as though the rich man had foreseen what was going to happen, for he suddenly dropped dead three days later. Nobody knew exactly how this had come to pass, but then no one cared. When he was buried, the poor man remembered his promise. He would have liked to have been released from it, but he thought, He treated you kindly, and you were able to feed your children with his grain. And even if that hadn't happened, you gave your promise, and you must keep it. At nightfall, he went into the churchyard and sat on top of the grave mound. Everything was quiet. Only the moon was shining over the grave mounds, and at times an owl flew overhead and screeched his doleful sounds. When the sun rose, the poor man went home unharmed, and the second night passed just as peacefully as the first. On the third night, he felt especially afraid. It seemed to him that something was going to happen. When he arrived at the churchyard, he noticed a man at the wall whom he'd never seen before. He was no longer young. He had scars on his face, and his eyes darted around sharply and fervidly. He was wrapped completely in an old coat, and only his large riding boots were visible. "'What are you looking for here?' the peasant asked him. "'Aren't you afraid of being out in the lonely churchyard?' "'I'm not looking for anything,' he answered, "'and I'm afraid of nothing.' I'm like the young man who set out to learn how to fear, who tried in vain and still won a king's daughter as a wife and great wealth along with her. However, I've always remained poor. I'm nothing but a discharged soldier, and I want to spend the night here because I don't have any other shelter. Well, if you're fearless, the peasant said, then stay with me and help me guard the grave mound. Oh, keeping guard is a soldier's business, he replied. Whatever we encounter here, good or evil, let that be our common lot. The peasant agreed, and they sat down together on the grave. Everything remained quiet until midnight. Then suddenly a shrill whistling could be heard in the air, and the two watchmen became aware of the presence of the evil one, who then stood in full life before them. "'Be gone, you scoundrels!' he bellowed at them. "'That man lying in the grave is mine. "'I've come to fetch him, and if you don't turn and leave, "'I'll twist and wring your necks.' "'Ah, oh, sir, with the red feather,' the soldier said, "'you're not my captain. I don't need to obey you, "'and I've yet to learn how to fear. "'So move on, for we're going to remain sitting here.' "'The devil thought.' 
Gold is the best way to trap these two meddlers. So he used a sweeter tone and asked very confidentially whether they would not like to have a bag of gold that they could take with them. Well, that's worth considering, the soldier answered. But just one bag of gold is not much use to us. If you'll give us as much gold as will go into one of my boots, we'll clear out and retreat. I don't have enough gold with me, the devil said, but I'll get it. There's a good friend of mine who's a money changer in the neighboring city. He'll gladly advance me the gold. After the devil had disappeared, the soldier took off his left boot and said, "Just wait. We'll soon be leading him around by the nose. Give me your knife, my friend." And then he cut off the sole of the boot and put the boot next to the mound in the high grass on the edge of a grave that was half covered with weeds. That's just right," he said. "Now let the chimney sweep return." The two men sat down and waited. It was not long before the devil came, carrying a small sack of gold in his hand. "Just pour it in there," said the soldier, and raised the boot a little in the air. "But that won't be enough." The black one emptied the sack. The gold fell through, and the boot remained empty. "Stupid devil!" exclaimed the soldier. "That won't do. Didn't I tell you right off? Now turn round and fetch some more." The devil shook his head and left. Came back after an hour with a much larger sack under his arm. Just fill it up, the soldier cried out. But I doubt the boot will become full. Well, the gold jingled as it dropped into the boot, but the boot remained empty. The devil peered into the boot himself with his glaring eyes and convinced himself of the truth. The calves of your legs must be ridiculously large, he cried out and made a wry face. Do you think, replied the soldier, that I have a cloven foot like yours? Since when have you been so stingy? See to it that you get more gold; otherwise, you can forget about our deal. The demon toddled off once again. This time, he stayed away longer than before. When he finally appeared, he was pa panting due to the weight of the pack he was carrying on his shoulders. He poured the gold into the boot, which remained just as empty as before. Then he became furious and wanted to tear the boot from the soldier's hand. But just at that moment, the first ray of the rising sun burst from the sky, and the evil spirit ran away, shrieking loudly. The poor soul had been saved. The peasant wanted to divide the gold, but the soldier said, "Ha!、Ah, give my share to poor people. I'll move in with you in your hut, and together we'll live quietly and peacefully with what's left over of the gold, as long as God permits." <laughs> wow, that's a great story. Very good story. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Never heard that one before. <laughs> no,、nope. it's what a clever soldier.、Mm -hmm. yeah. Very、and、clever guy. Yes, yeah, very very clever. Outwitting that devil. <laughs> <laughs> three times the devil had to go, and three nights the the、uh, guard had to be held on the on the grave. So, well, numerology has always played a big part in mythology and stories. And so, what is the three representing? Yeah, all sorts of things, Laurie. You were reading about that on our way over here about the threes. Yeah, the threes, the sacred triangle,、um, equilateral triangle represents the the, the female power. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Just visualize you radio people an upside down triangle.、Mm -hmm. So the point is facing down. The point is facing down.、Uh, so that's three sides, three、mm -hmm. points.、Um, female power back to、uh, the ancient goddess. And、um, how important she was to everybody.、Mm -hmm. And the th three has always been、mm -hmm. a, a sacred number, even in Christianity. It is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Absolutely, it's always、yeah. three. Yes, they、yeah. co-opted that three as well.、Um, <laughs> but you know, all all the all the famous little stories that people know: the three little pigs and the、yeah. three、mm -hmm. Billy Goats Gruff, and、yeah. the, yeah, the three, three Musketeers. Three. Yes, yeah, it's always three.、Uh -huh. Isn't that、so. funny? Because socially, three is an awkward number. <laughs> when、right. the kids, when the kids have friends and it's a group of three, someone's always left out.、Oh. And the triangle switches all the time.、Mm. Yes, you know, two, which、yeah. two are together, then one is、yeah. not, and then the other two, and one is not. Who's on the outs?、Yeah. Got、That's、the maiden、true. mother crone. Yes. You've got the three phases of the moon. You've、yeah. got the、uh, yeah. Yeah. So three, a lot of threes. But you're right. Socially, three is. No, third、oh. man out, the third,、yeah. the third wheel.、Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Again, threes, <laughs> yeah,、yes. but not in such a great way.、Mm -hmm. So、yes. that portrays the devil as kind of somebody who can be tricked rather easily. 
Yes, I suppose so. Um, although people always like, as you said earlier, to think that they were in charge and making the wheel of the earth go and so on. So people always think maybe they can... Uh, Outsmart, outsmart the devil. Outsmart mm-hmm. the devil, yes. Which is a good thing to think. I think it gives people a positive outlook, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we got the bad guy. <laughs> well, that's it for Fresh Waves this week. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear this broadcast again, you can go to our YouTube page, Fresh Waves Radio, and you can hear the whole podcast there. Tune in again next Sunday on Whistle FM for more Fresh Waves. And thank you for joining us today. We wish everyone a really, really happy and a safe Halloween.